from our Hebrew roots. Pastor Mark is going to share that in our first session tonight with Hidden Treasures. And he's going to start off with, um, well, I'll let him tell you all this, but he's going to start off with the first letter. And we've been through Shalom TV. Uh, most of you have been here for that uh, class that we had, which was really a good class. Gave us an overview of the Hebrew language. But then secondly, we had, of course, the extended, the intermediate with Brent Emery. But we're going back to basics in a different way because now Pastor Mark is going to cover these letters individually in the spiritual meaning behind them, upside down, right side up, left and right, right? So let's open with prayer tonight. Father, we, Father, we, we raise a prayer to you tonight. Father, our hearts are open to you that, uh, Father, that we're always in a state of wanting to hear what our, what our Abba has to teach us. And that, Father, how you speak through uh, your teachers, your pastors, uh, and that, Father, that we have a, a gifted individual to teach us these things, that, uh, that we can take them and, and share them with others that can take uh, Torah to the nations. We, we love you, we bless you, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Pastor Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, just so you know also, concerning going to Israel, I'd mentioned it last Monday in the last Shabbat, Tentatively, right now, we're looking at the last week of October, first week of November. And uh, basically, we always want to limit it to one bus, so around 45, 48 people. Uh, we already had uh, a family of five from Finland call us, so they want to come. And, uh, but it'll be filling up pretty fast, so please do call the office to get on a, a list, and hopefully within the next month or so, we'll have everything nailed down. How many of you have been to Israel here? Quite a few? All right. How many of you have not been to Israel but want to go? Yay! <clears throat> well, I tell you what, our, our tours are totally different than anything you've ever been on. Believe me, those that have been on them I know what I'm talking about. Well, tonight we are going to do something really different. Uh, Lenny, if you would, go ahead and put up the first clip. You know, instead of saying alphabet, practice saying Aleph Bet. That's what alphabet came from, the Aleph Bet. Here's the Aleph, there's the Bet, and there's all the letters, and the last letter is the Tav. So this is the Hebrew Aleph Bet that we'll be talking about. But what I want to do, I want to start this year out with some pictures some of you have seen before, some of you may not have seen. But to me, the, the whole thing is a paradigm shift. What I want to do is change your perspective. I want you to see the Hebrew language as more than just letters. First off, let's take a look at this. <clears throat> see Earth, Venus, Mars, Mercury, Pluto. These are dimensional ratio size differences. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I thought I had the biggest backyard in the world. And as an adult, I go back and there's like a little postage stamp. You know what I'm talking about? You think it's so big. Well, when you look at the size of the earth, and all of you that have been to Israel, that's halfway around the world. After that 12-hour, 24-hour flight, you know it's a pretty big place. Wouldn't you say that the earth is pretty big, really, when you look at it compared to these other planets? Earth is big. Well, let's take another look at the earth here. Here's the earth compared to some of the other planets. All of a sudden, the earth doesn't look quite as big anymore, right? What a perspective. You realize, oh my goodness, look how many earths could fit in Jupiter. Can you imagine? Pluto is real small now. Look at that compared to Jupiter. Now, once you say Jupiter's big, I mean, Jupiter's big. Well, here's Jupiter compared to the sun. Earth is here, Pluto's about one pixel in size, so could you imagine how many Earths would fit in the sun? And that's our closest star. And I tell you what, when I look at this, the sun is what's big. Wouldn't you say the sun is big? Here's our sun compared to a couple of the other stars. Arcturus is the star that's in the, the constellation Bootes, in the knee. I mean, I mean the sun is small. Jupiter is about one pixel in size. Earth is invisible. All of a sudden, when you look at these stars, you realize, oh my goodness, the sun is nothing. All of a sudden, this incredible shrinking feeling starts to happen over us as human beings. 
Now, when you see Arcturus, now you're saying, now that is a big star. Well, here's Arcturus right here compared to some of the other stars in our universe. On Taurus, now that is a big star. Where would Earth be? Now, wouldn't you say on Taurus is a big star? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, here's on Taurus compared to the big dog star, Canis Majoris. Now, when you look at how big Canis Majoris is, it is so big, it would take you, two, I think, 2,500 years at 500 miles an hour to go around it once. I mean, it is gigantic. Even at the speed of light, it takes like a year for a speed of light. I mean, this thing is so huge. Now, where would Earth be? Where would you be? Got his perspective changed a little bit. You know, what I can't believe in, in Isaiah, I mean, in the distance between these stars, I mean, you have to, I mean, how, what's the speed of light? 186,000 miles per second? And some of these are like 3,000 light years away, so you've got to travel at 186,000 miles per second for 3,000 years before you can even get close. So look at how huge the universe is. Look how big some of these stars and these planets are. In Isaiah, it says this entire thing is in the palm of God's hand. We serve a pretty big God. And now think about this. If here God created all of this to be our nursery, so we could look at him and glorify him. It says the heavens are always declaring the glory of God. You know, we're just blown away. Now imagine this. If the entire universe is in his hand, it says in Isaiah, the nations are a drop in the bucket. The mountains are, are like on little scales, like God has to have little tiny fingers to even work with these big Mount Rainiers. There's nothing. So if the entire universe is in the palm of his hand, where would man be? And the most incredible thing to me is God looks down and said, hey, I made all of this for you. Can I have a relationship with you? Now that is humbling. And the most incredible thing to me is man will stand there and go, no. All God has to do is go Poof. And off we go, spinning into the outer universe. But to me, that's the most incredible thing, is that this creator of, uh, of all the universe loves us and wants to have a relationship with us. This is mind-blowing. What I want to do is kind of have us look at the macro as well as the micro. When you look at uh, some of these things that God created, it's just incredible that are all throughout the, the universe, these different galaxies and nebulas and sombrero galaxy. This is called the crown of thorns galaxy. Some of you might be familiar with the horsehead nebula in Orion. I love astronomy. You guys know what that is? The whirlpool galaxy? The amazing thing about the whirlpool galaxy in relationship to here's earth, it's not like this. It's vertical and it's going like this. So the Hubble Space Telescope zoomed right into the center of the whirlpool galaxy and took a picture of the center of that and send it back. And you can look at this on NASA's website. Remember the heavens declare the glory of God? This was the picture of Hubble. Oh, it's not there. Anyway, it's the picture of a cross. It's in the middle of it. It's just incredible. <clears throat> okay, uh, one of my heroes has spoken here before, Frank Seekins, and he's the one that teaches a lot on the picture language. So I like to give the credit where credit is due, but let's go ahead and go back. The ancient Hebrew script uh, was used by the Jews even before uh, the exile in Babylon, you know, around 586 BC. And every letter was actually kind of like a picture. Uh, when you look at some of the old coins, you know, from 2,000 years ago, you'll see the ancient Hebrew script on those writings. But uh, they were and are a perfect phonetic system and much more. Every letter is also a picture with a meaning. So for example, now I know some of you can read that, right? If you remember, the Aleph was an ox, and the shepherd's staff was the Lamed, and so that would be El, as in Elohim, or God. And what do we see? The ox represents that which is strong, that which goes first, and the Lamed represents authority, so they would see that God is the first authority, God is a strong authority. So that's how it worked. <clears throat> so for example, the Aleph in Hebrew, uh, one of the meanings you're gonna see is ox or a bull. Moses drew that like this, 
And then as the letters evolved, David drew it like this. Uh, the letter Beit in Hebrew means tent or house. So Moses drew a three-room house. David drew a tent on a landscape. So every letter was also a picture having a word. Uh, the letter He in Hebrew means to behold. It was like a window or you can see this is like a window. And here's the middle part of the window. This is almost looks like a person going, hey, over here. You know, it means to reveal. Yud in Hebrew means hand, so they drew the picture of, you know, a forearm. So, but look, this became our letter A. Alphabet, Aleph Bet, this is what it came from. So in the evolution of the language, that's how it got there. <clears throat> the letter Bait became our B. Do you see how simple it is? God literally wrote the Bible in a picture language, like on a first grade level, just so everyone could look at the pictures. <clears throat> so here, what do you see? The Aleph and the bait, an ox and a house. Who is the strength of the house? Father, so Abba is daddy, Av is father, that's the word Av. They would see an ox and a house and say, well, that's dad, he's the strength of the house. So that's the word for dad in Hebrew, Av, or father. So Moses would have written father, like when he wrote the word father, he would have drawn the picture of an ox in a house. David would have drawn it like that. And so it becomes Ab or Abba, using the same ancient letters, just moved over to look like the English letters. <clears throat> so let's start with the very first letter, Aleph. Now you guys should have two set of notes. One of them is what we're going to be covering tonight, a couple pages long. And then the other one uh, has the entire Hebrew alphabet with the ancient picture language, with how Moses wrote it, how David wrote it, and what it looks like. If you don't have that, raise your hand. Okay, a lot of people didn't get the second one. So if we could have some ushers help and pass that one out. But this is a really cool handout because you can see how the, the letters all evolved into what they are today. Also, this is accessible on our website. If you have friends that want a copy of this, you can email it from our website, and they can print it out from our website. We're not going to cover that whole page tonight. That's just something for you to have this the whole several months that we go through this. So you'll have that copy. There's still some hands raised if people could get some more copies out to people. Okay, I'll continue here now. The Aleph, because it goes first, it's kind of like the leader. It's the head of all the letters. Now, what a lot of people don't realize, you only see this in Hebrew, you don't see this in English. But what I have up on the screen, which you can't see probably, but you might be able to, is Psalms 119. Most people don't know the entire Psalms 119 is praising the Hebrew alphabet. You only see this in Hebrew. There are 176 verses in Psalms 119. The reason why, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and they give eight verses in praise of each letter. And 22 times eight is 176. And if you'll notice here, what you only see in Hebrew, this is Psalms 119, this is verse one. Here's verse two, because there's the bait, and the, every letter's a number. That's verse three, Gimel, verse four, Dalit, you know, hey is five. But I want you to notice, every verse begins with a different word, that begins with the letter Aleph. The way David wrote that verse, every, all eight verses begin with a word beginning with the letter Aleph. The next eight verses all begin with a letter, a word that begins with the letter Beit. And then the next eight verses all begin in Hebrew with different words that begin with the letter Gimel, and then Dalet, and then Hey, and then Vav. So the whole thing is using God's language to praise him. And the, the first eight verses on the Aleph Okay, that's what goes first. You really want to pay close attention because, again, this is what God is trying to communicate. And here we see, happy are those people who walk in Torah. Now, why in the world would you want to do away with Torah when right here it says, happy are those people who are walking in Torah? I like to be happy. <clears throat> happy are those who keep his testimonies. They do no iniquity because they walk in all of his ways. You commanded us to keep your precepts. So here you have Torah, testimonies, ways, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments. Okay, statutes again. But I just wanted to point out, in case you didn't know, in Psalms 119, every single verse begins with 
a section of the Hebrew letter Aleph. Then the next one's Bait, and it goes down. Uh, so there's Psalm 119, 1 through 8. I'll give it a little. Here you can see the Aleph all the way down. Do you see that? You know, different Hebrew words, but they all begin with Aleph. Okay, here is uh, the virtuous woman. And you can't see this top one, but the word begins, the first, uh, verse 10 begins with an Aleph. Verse 11 begins with a Bait, Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Vav, Zane. So it, it, it goes through the entire Hebrew alphabet in the, in the virtuous woman. And what the, the Hebrew alphabet shows perfection, completeness. So what it's trying to say, this is the complete, perfect woman. And you only see that in Hebrew when you can see how he's designed it. When he wrote, can you imagine writing poetry and be able to come up uh, with a different letter all the way through and have it make sense of a different word? In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Therefore wait you upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth will be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Boy, that's kind of an interesting statement. What does that have to do with the Hebrew alphabet, right? Well, do you know this is the only verse in the entire Bible that utilizes every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet, even the final forms? It's the only verse. It has every Hebrew letter in it. And guess what the very next verse is? 3, 9. Then I'll return to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. The Hebrew language is coming back. That's what this is prophesying. So the verse before, he utilizes every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then he says, and I'm going to turn to the people a pure language. So some of us are going to get the free Hebrew download one day. So we always say everything from A to Z as far as the dictionary from A to Z. And Hebrew would be from the Aleph to the Tav. Okay, and the Aleph Tav is also very significant, and it symbolizes completion and perfection. As a matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 20, where it talks about the Ten Commandments, the very first word of the Ten Commandments begins with the letter Aleph. Let's take a look at this. In Exodus 20, verse 2, right here it is. You'll see Aleph. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So I made it a little bit bigger here for you in case that's too small. There's a, a saying, uh, and again, a, a lot of this is just midrash, okay? Uh, allegory and talking and things like that. But the sages have always wondered, you know, how come... The Bible started with bait. That's the second letter. How come it didn't start with the letter Aleph? Well, the interesting thing in the Hebrew language, the Aleph is silent. It can't speak for itself, so to speak. But uh, Aleph speaks of the father. Bait speaks of the son. And so here he begins creation, starting with the letter bait, representing the son, which we'll talk about next week. Let's go back. So here we have the letter Aleph. The Aleph is the numeral one, as you saw in Psalms 119, uh, like in, you know, Roman letters were numbers, okay? It was the same thing in Hebrew. So the Aleph stands for the number one. It means one and only, unique. It's indivisible. The Aleph implies divinity. It implies monotheism, just like, you know, we believe in monotheism. There's one God. The interesting thing about Aleph I'm putting the vowel points for you here because there's no vowels in Hebrew. Like I said, the Aleph is silent. So this is how you would spell Aleph. This is the letter Aleph, but you hear the L in Aleph, and that's the F. So here's how you spell this. Here's the letter, and here's how you spell this letter. Everyone make sense? You all following me? The interesting thing about the Aleph, which is the number one, the Aleph... The numerical value is one. The Lamed, the numerical value of the Lamed is 30. And the Pei or Fe is 80. So added up, it's 111, 111. Which is kind of interesting too when you think of the triunity of God. Okay, so here we have Aleph. And 
uh, I have here on my notes, and you can look on your notes there, a left from Strong's number 505. It says it's the same as Strong's number 504, and it means the ox's head. And that is why the letter means an ox's head, so they drew an ox's head for the letter. Does that make sense? Makes it easy to remember. <clears throat> so it's the first letter of the alphabet. This eventually is used as a numeral, and it also means 1,000. So LF, Aleph is one, LF is a thousand, like elephant. Okay, so the, just changing the vowels a little bit, using the same letters, it can be one or a family, I mean one or a thousand. So the Aleph can mean ox, the Aleph can also mean like an entire family. In Genesis chapter 20 and verse 16, here it says, and unto Sarah, he said, behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. And here the word for a thousand is a left. So here you can see where it can be 1000. Now look at Strong's number 441, aloof. Here they add the vav, but it still comes from that same root word, 502. It can also mean a friend. It can mean gentle. Uh, What's the, there's a big difference between an ox and a raging bull. An ox is big and strong, but tame. <clears throat> and believe it or not, this word can also mean a captain, a, a chief friend, a governor, a guide, or an ox. So look at all these different things you can get out of this one letter. So there's your ox. See, that's how David did it. That's how Moses did it. Do you see the ox here? Do you see the horns? Okay. And then notice how it became our letter A. So here's LF. There's Aleph and here's LF. And now Aloof. Now let me mention this. I'm going to show you how it can have these different meanings. I'm giving you the Bible verses, and you can look these up yourself. But in Proverbs 16, 28, it says, A forward man sows strife, and a whisperer separates chief friends. That's the word aloof. So you see the word chief and friend. In Jeremiah 3, 4, it says, Will you not from this time cry unto me, my father? You are the guide of my youth. There's aloof. So the, when you see that letter, you can be thinking of a friend, you can think of a guide, you can think of someone who's gentle, a chief, the father. Now, doesn't all those describe God the Father? I'm your friend. I want to be your guide. I want you to yoke up with me. I'm the ox that's going to carry the load. I mean, all of this is describing the Father. <clears throat> I think it's so interesting that, you know, God, you would think when something is strong, you know what's interesting? That I find Someone who's really strong, when they come up to shake your hand, they're, they're trying to be gentle. Someone who's not real strong tries to squeeze it real hard to show you how tough they are. You know, God doesn't need to show how tough he is. God is strong, so he's very gentle. <clears throat> In Psalms 144, verse 14 and 15, it says that our oxen may be strong to labor. Well, that's the word aloof. So you can see again how this letter can have multiple meanings. It says, strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Must be a revival going on. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Now look at Zechariah. This is chapter 12, verse 6 through 9. It says, in that day will I make the governors of Judah, and look at that, it's the same word, aloof. So this word is, can be governors, it can be oxen, it can be guide, it can be chief friends. But look what it says. It says, in that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem will be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first. 
that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them, and it will come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all those nations that are coming against Jerusalem. That is a powerful verse. And I can't help but think of what, as Art was mentioning, as we talked to this colonel from the IDF, and a few weeks ago, we were on a military base in Israel talking to these fine young soldiers. And I tell you, uh, we really want to support those. I mean, I, we have many people here that are pro-Second Amendment. We have many people here that are pro-military. And I tell you what, we really need to support the IDF because look at this verse. I really want to pray that these soldiers would really come to know the Lord and they would really fight for God and for his word uh, that this prophecy would take place. But I tell you what, what are those nations that are coming against Jerusalem? But look at this. The word aleph, which is the primitive root, means to associate with, hence to learn, to teach, to learn or teach. See that letter Lamed, which we'll get to in about six weeks or so, the ver that's in the middle of that word Aleph, literally means to teach. Lamed is the, the means to teach. And so right here we see uh, that even the word Aleph means to learn or to teach. We see this in Job chapter 33, verse 33. It says, if not, hearken unto me, hold your peace, and I will teach you wisdom. Well, the word teach there is Aleph. It's the letter Aleph. So a left can also mean to teach. So you can see the idea of guiding and teaching. And so what does God want us to do? He wants to guide us. He wants to teach us. And the, God is the Aleph. He's the, the strong leader. As a, uh, it can also imply master. And so I think it's interesting is in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Aleph. See what men are stones and what buildings are here. See, that would, if you look at the Greek, uh, I have the Greek here, 1320. It means an instructor, a doctor, master, teacher. Well, that's Greek. But Hebrew, he, they would have been saying, you're the Aleph, which I think is highly significant. So the letter Aleph symbolizes the one and only, the eternal, omnipotent God. Now, let's take a moment and look at this letter Aleph. There's something interesting about this letter. And the thing that I want to do more than anything, whether you agree with it or not, I'm not saying you have to agree with me. That's not the point. If you disagree with me, that's great. But how many of you know the Jews have been looking at this stuff for several thousand years? What kind of Johnny come lately? And uh, so to me, why not go to the, the source to find a lot of these things? Now, I don't agree with everything I read, but they love to study. And just like when I showed, like a snowflake, you can look at a snowflake and then you look at it under a microscope and you see the beauty of it. The way they, they love God so much and they love his language so much is like they look at it under a microscope and can we find God here? Can we find God there? They're always looking for God, even in the minutia. Well, you take this letter Aleph and what they say, well, let me mention this. I remember I told you how the Aleph stands for God, right? And this is, this is the tetragrammaton, the Yud, the He, the Vav, He, translated Yahweh, Yehovah, however you want to say it. But that is God's name. Now, remember how every letter is also a number, right? So right here, the Yud is 10, the He is 5, the Vav is 6, the He is 5, so that's 26. <clears throat> so as they study their Bible, they're looking for every possible connection, and they say, when there's a numeric value that's equal of two different words, then there's a tie-in somewhere we need to be looking for, okay? Well, as I told you, the Aleph stands for God. Yahweh stands for God. And so they looked at the letter Aleph, and they said, my goodness, the, Ulef, the Aleph is made up of a Vav, which, which is laying on a, on a diagonal, which is the numeric value of six, but it also has a Yud and another Yud. So they said, well, look at this, the Aleph, is made up of a vav and two yuds. Well, guess what? The yuds have a value of 10, the vav of six, so that equals 26, which is the same as the yud he vav he. Do you think that's a wow? Watch this. In Hebrew, the yud means what? Or the yod is hand. 
Do you remember the old Michelangelo painting of the hand coming down from heaven and the hand coming up from earth and God's trying to connect the two? Okay. So here, let's take the LF. Remember when at the burning bush, God told Moses his name. Each one of these words began with an Aleph. It's a yeah, a she, a, a, a yeah. But it's Aleph, 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 which means I am that I am. And if you'll notice, you have I am and I am. It's repeated. And you have the middle that's different. Do you notice that? Okay, so you have two words the same, one in the middle that's different. But that's what he said his name was. Okay, so I want you to think of grass in the heavens, right? And you have man's hand reaching up to heaven. You have God's hand coming down. And what do you have? You have the vav, the nailed the Messiah. And the vav in he, ancient Hebrew was a nail. So here you have a yud, a yud, and a vav. That means hand. So the Jews themselves say this is a hand, a hand, and a vav. And the only way, Yeshua is the only one who connects heaven and earth. So right here in the letter Aleph, you have that. And this is what the, the sages say. The Jewish sages say this is two yuds and a vav. It equals 26. And the yuds are hand. And that's a vav. <clears throat> Here's the Aleph uh, is 111. Okay, many of the names of God start with the letter Aleph, which is why they say the Aleph stands for God. Can anybody read that? Adonai. Adonai is one. Let's look at other names for God that begin with Aleph. <clears throat> What's that? Av, which is Father. Now, again, I use the ancient picture language here. What is this? This was on that little stone. El, like Elohim, short for Elohim, the strong authority, the first authority. What's that? That's Av again. It's just using Moses' writings. Yeah, Bait is a house. That's the little house you come in. Okay. That's the Aleph Tav. That's the untranslated word. Do you know this word appears often in your Bible and you don't know it because it's not translated? As a matter of fact, in Genesis 1.1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This all of Tav is right in the middle, and you don't know it because they don't put it in there. But it's very significant. It represents Yeshua. And uh, maybe next week I'll show you some things about that. But in the ancient Hebrew, when Moses would have written that, it would have looked like this, the leader nailed to the covenant. That would have been all of Tav. Isn't that pretty incredible? Okay, here is El, and what is this? Elohim. So all these names for God begin with the letter Aleph, which is why they say the Aleph by itself represents God. Now here's the interesting thing too about the name Elohim. <clears throat> here is Elohim, but it also can be divided up. El represents God. Elim means to be silent. In Isaiah 53, where Yeshua was, it says, as a lamb before a shearer is dumb, it means to be silent and not speak. That's what alim means. Alim, the Aleph Lamed Mem, means to be silent. You see that in Isaiah 53, you'll see that word where it says dumb. Look it up, it's alim. So here we see, again, remember the letter Aleph means to be what? Silent. The Aleph is a silent. And so here we have El, representing God, silent, the middle two letters of Elohim is oi, which means grief or pain. So here we see God is a God who is silent in his grief and in his pain. You can see that right in the word Elohim. I can't help but think of Genesis 6, 6, where it says, It repented the Lord that he made man, and it grieved him in his heart. And here, when Yeshua is being beaten and tortured in Isaiah 53, he kept all of his, you know, the grief was inside. 1 John 1, 5, it says God is light, right? Well, what's the Hebrew word for light? Or it begins with the letter Aleph. <clears throat> In 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Well, guess what the Hebrew word for love is? Ahava. And the amazing thing about this, see, again, it begins with Aleph. But do you remember? The Aleph bait is Av, which means father. 
the letter He means to reveal. So God is love. It's the Father's heart revealed. Pretty cool. Deuteronomy 4, 24, God is a consuming fire. And what's the Hebrew word for fire? Aish. It's the Aleph Sheen. Again, the, the names of God begin with the letter Aleph, which is why they say it represents God. In Genesis 1, 26, it says uh, man was created in God's image. And guess what? This is, who can read that? Adam, Adam. Okay. Because God created man in his image, Adam's name begins with the letter Aleph. Now, the interesting thing about this word, this is how Moses would have written it in the ancient Paleo-Hebrew. Again, the Aleph was the ox, which means the first, the leader. The Dalet, this was like a tent door. This is the Dalet. You can turn it around and see R-D. You, this is the M of, uh, you can see the M, our current M, but this was crashing wave, waves of water symbolizing chaos. So Adam's very name means the leader through the door into chaos. That was the ancient picture language. And if you take God out of man's life, all that's left is the word dom in Hebrew means blood. And what happens with Cain and Abel? And that's what's happened to mankind. Adam literally means mankind. But with God's not in man's life, we become a very bloody people. Now, we were created in God's image. So what's interesting is you can take the yud heh vav heh and you've got the head, the shoulders, the arms, the torso, the waist, and the legs. Genesis 28, 12, it says, How Jacob dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on earth. And the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So here, that vav that was leaning, think of it as Jacob's ladder with the angels ascending and descending. And in John 151, what do we find? Yeshua was saying, he said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter you'll see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon who? The Son of Man. So that's showing you Yeshua was the ladder, the vav that I was just showing you in the letter Aleph, which also shows you how he's God. As a matter of fact, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 11, concerning Yeshua, it says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So I just think it's quite interesting when you look at the letter Aleph and the two hands and the vav and think of Jacob's ladder. In Isaiah 41.4, concerning the Aleph Tav, look at what it says. Who has wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. So what he's saying there is I'm the Aleph and the Tav. I'm the complete. I'm the perfection. Isaiah 44, 6, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me, there's how many? There's only one first. There can't be two firsts. There's only one first. There's only one last. Isaiah 48, 12 and 13, it says, hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I also am the last. My hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. And then in Revelation 22, with this in mind, rather than reading, I'm the Alpha and Omega, we should be reading, I am the Aleph Tav, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is showing you the divinity of Yeshua. He says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. And there's an interesting, I think it's in Revelation 3, where it talks about the first and the last who was dead and is now alive. Now that's very theologically significant. <clears throat> in uh, 1 John 4, 8, it says, he that loves not knoweth not God, for God is love. Can you believe we've already gone 45 minutes on one letter? Has time flown by, though? It's incredible. Okay, here's some other exciting things. I want you to see this. Here is the Hebrew word for man, ish. 
And again, man was created in God's image. See, there's Adam, which is mankind. Man is Ish. Now, what's interesting is you have the Aleph, the Yud, Shin. What does the Aleph stand for, represent? God, right? What happens if you take God out of this man's life? You end up with the Yud, Shin, which just means mere substance. You're just flesh. If God's not in your life, you're just a man of the flesh. Isn't that interesting? The Hebrew language can do things like this. You, can't, you don't see this in English. And uh, I'll just tell you guys this when I don't have the thing for it. But remember the, the Hebrew word for fire was what? The aleph and the sheen. Okay. So here's the word for fire, aleph sheen. The word for man is you throw the you. See, is God a consuming fire? Man was created in God's image. So man is also a consuming fire, the Aleph Sheen. And the Yud makes the word man instead of fire. And the Yud is a hand, so man works in the midst of the fire. The Hebrew word for woman is Isha, which is an Aleph Sheen with the He at the end. And the He means to behold or reveal. So the concept for woman is she who comes out of the fire. They both have in common the Aleph Sheen, which is fire. But when they get married, the man brings the letter Yud, the woman brings the letter He, and it forms God's name, Yah. And remember the burning bush? It was not consumed with fire because God was in its midst. Same thing within a marriage. If husband and wife come together, one brings the Yud, one brings the He, but if you don't have God in a relationship, all you have is fire and you consume each other. You can see that in the Hebrew. So, it says here, Leviticus 1.1. 1, 1. It says, and the Lord called unto Moses. This is the word Vayikra, okay? I want you to notice something. You know, again, you're not going to see this in your English Bibles. You're only going to see it in the Hebrew. This is the word, and he called, okay, Vayikra. But there's something different in the Bible. It's not written like this in your Bible or in the Hebrew Bible. What happens, I want you to notice something. This is Vayikar with, uh, without the Aleph on the end. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 16. It says, and the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth. And he said, go again to Balak and say this. Well, where it says the Lord met Balaam, it's this word, Vayakar. And it means by happenstance. God just happened to come upon Balaam. Well, Moses didn't like the word Vayikra, they say, just say, because that implies God had a personal relationship with Moses. So they say Moses said, God, you know, Moses in all of his humility was saying, God, I don't, let's just use Vayakar, like Balaam, that we just, you just, I don't want to act so prideful like you wanted to meet with me. And they say, God said, no, you know, I want Vayakra. But because of your humility, we'll write it like this. And the Aleph is made real small. And every Hebrew Bible, since the time of Moses, the letter Aleph is made small. Uh, and so the sages say that God answered Moses and said, okay, we want, I have to have Baikra. And there's reasons for that because every letter is also a number. And so the, the numerics is very important. But anyway, in every Hebrew Bible, this is one of the jots and tittles where the Aleph is made small, which is kind of interesting. You know, uh, the interesting thing, like I said before about humility, humility is not putting yourself down. Humility is forgetting about yourself. You transcend self. You're not, you don't even think about yourself. Um, think of it th this way. If you're standing on a 10-story building, do you think you're 10 stories tall? I remember I have like 100 nephews and nieces, believe it or not. And what's always fun is to put them up on your shoulders, and they think they're so tall. You know, they don't understand. But uh, I think what we need to realize is we need humility do you remember the cherubs? When you think of the little cherubs, remember the little baby faces they would always draw of the cherubs? You know, uh, literally they say that the, the, on the Ark of the Covenant, the two angels that were cherubs were more like baby faces. And the sages say that's because to understand the Torah, you have to have the attitude of a child, being a learner, being humble. 
<clears throat> now, here's something else that's kind of interesting. See, here's the Genesis 1 1. Bereshit, bara, Elohim. Here's that Aleph Tab, et Hashemayim, et Haaretz. So it's in the beginning, created God, the heavens and the earth. You have seven words here. And right here is that all left tab, that untranslated word where it represents the Messiah. He says, I'm the first and the last. Remember in Revelation, John sees a menorah. A menorah has how many branches? And in the midst, he saw one like into fire. Well, there's seven words, just like the seven branch menorah. And right in the middle is the all left tab, which is Yeshua. But here's what's interesting. Remember I said the letter Aleph stands for what number? One, but it also stands for 1,000, right? Well, one of the interesting things, if you'll notice, there are six Alephs for 6,000 years for mankind before the Messiah comes. They say there are six Alephs. That's the same as 6,000. Again, they're saying it's encoded that there was 6,000 years until the millennial reign, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so we can see Aleph is kind of, uh, quite interesting. In uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 10, get a load of this. It says, beat your plowshares into swords. Did you know the Hebrew word for plowshares there is Aleph Tav? Yeah, go look it up. The word for plowshares is Aleph Tav. Well, I think that's very significant. This is Aleph, right? Going vertical. We remember that Aleph stands for God, right? So what the letter Aleph tells us is we come to Elohim. The Lamed is to learn or teach. We must be taught by him, and the pay is a mouth, so we must speak of him. This is what the Aleph tells us. We need to come to the Father, be taught of him, and speak of him. You get that from the letter Aleph. But in Joel chapter 3, verse 10, it talks about to beat your plowshares into swords. We'll look at Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28, and 30. It says, come unto me, all you, that are labor, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn to me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest to your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. This is quoting the book of Jeremiah, as a matter of fact. And here, when you, you read, take my yoke upon you, I can't help but think of Yeshua as the ox carrying the yoke, and he wants us to yoke up with him. Okay, think of the Aleph. Yeshua was saying, I'm the ox, I am God, I'm the Aleph. And uh, put, and learn of me. That's the letter Aleph, okay? And to find rest. Now, if you look at this, here is the ox. Here's your plowshare, right? And so I think it's interesting that when you think of the Aleph as the ox, and the, Yeshua is the plowshare, and we're the earth and vessel, and what does he want to do? He wants to plow this earth and vessel. Uh, in Hosea, this isn't on your notes, but in Hosea 10, 12, it says, sow in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. So when, when I think of the word break the fallow ground and I see the ox and I see the Aleph Tav is the, the plowshare, I can't help but see God in all of this in so many different levels. You following me here? Isn't that just incredible that you can see all of this out of the one letter Aleph? So there's the Hebrew Aleph Bet that we'll be talking about. So next week, we're going to discuss the letter Bait. And is it incredible? I hope you've enjoyed a little. I just could touch on the Aleph tonight. But there's so much to that. But I hope you enjoyed the letter Aleph. <clears throat> and I hope that this will also help all of you learn the Hebrew language, because every week we're going to just cover one letter. So you'll get the visuals, you'll begin to understand it. So by the end of this course here in 22 weeks or so, you'll be able to look at the Hebrew language in a whole another perspective. And so now what we want to do, we have a little bit of time left. Uh, because we have so many people asking questions all over the world, you know, and a lot of people were saying they really liked it when we had question and answer time uh, because I don't have a lot of time after each service to answer questions like I would like to. So we wanted to utilize this as a time to answer questions. And we've already had dozens of people from all over the world emailing us questions. So I have some of the questions already here that I'm going to uh, read and then I'll try to answer them real quickly. But if there's anyone here that might have a question or two, raise your hand and I can have Art or Tom will take the mic to you. But I'll start with some of these uh, questions here. I can't answer all the 
uh, questions right now. Some of them I, I might do individually by email. So let me see which one of these. Oh, this one was kind of interesting. I'll start with this one. It says, my question for Pastor Mark is, what is the theological significance of the Almighty always preferring the younger brother? Remember, you have Jacob and Esau, and, you know, and who got it? Jacob. And you have Ishmael and Isaac, and who got it? You know, and Cain and Abel, and who got it? So I thought that was a very good question. And then I noticed who it was from. It was from my younger brother. <laughs> uh, I thought, oh, that's great. He follows along with me here. So I had to... <laughs> Anyways. Uh, what's the answer? Well, I think... You know, one thing that's interesting, too, is I think from the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, it's first the natural, then the spiritual. And, and I think a lot of times that's just how it... There's blessings for the firstborn. The firstborn always gets incredible blessings, you know. But a lot of times it's earthly blessings rather than spiritual blessings, you know. Okay, but for him, I give him a different answer. No. Uh, well, see, what's funny, what I, what I, actually what I did tell him, I said, I'm, I'm glad you said the younger brother, not the youngest brother, because I have two other older brothers, so I'm a younger brother too. Okay, here's a, a good question. I mean, we got questions from Finland and, and all over the world, South Africa, but here's this one. And I think some of you guys can relate to this. The question is, I'm often struggling with the question of what kind of events and holidays should I and my family celebrate during the year as non-Jewish believers in Jesus? By God's order, I was born a non-Jew, and those feasts were entrusted to his, chosen, to his one chosen nation to be preserved through all these centuries. So I'm studying them, and I'm understanding them, but there doesn't seem to be more to them than that. I would be thankful to know your thoughts on this. You know, I mean, a lot of people have that question. Look, I'm not a Jew. What should I have anything to do with these Jewish feasts? Well, one of the things I like to stress is from Leviticus chapter 23, where it does not say these are the feasts of the Jews. It says these are the feasts of the Lord. So these are the Lord's feasts. And the problem is the English language does not do justice. The word feast in Hebrew does not mean food. The Hebrew word is moed, and it means a divine appointment. So God is saying, I want to have a divine appointment with you. Think of it like a day timer. If your boss said he wanted to meet you at Tuesday at 2 o'clock, are you going to say, no, 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 let me check my schedule, I'll get back to you? You know, that doesn't work. So these are, these are God's divine appointments. Think of it this way, because all too often people say, well, God is everywhere, and, you know, everything's the same, and all this kind of thing. But when the tabernacle in the wilderness, when Moses' tabernacle was there, the Shekinah came on that tabernacle, didn't it? Did that mean God wasn't still in China? Does that mean God wasn't in South Africa? No, but he was in Egypt, I mean in Sinai, in a very special way where the divine presence was there. So when God says, I want to have an appointment with you, it's not like God isn't everywhere else. But when God sets an appointment, he says he's going to be with you. He's going to be there in a special way at a different level than he's going to be everywhere else or at any other time. And so that's very important to realize. Now, the other thing is we have the, the holiday of Hanukkah coming up. Okay, Purim and Hanukkah are both biblical holidays, but they're not necessarily feasts of the Lord. They're cultural holidays. Okay, And so when it comes to cultural holidays, a lot of people misunderstand Romans 10, uh, where it talks about this. But when it comes to cultural holidays, you're not obligated to keep the, the Jewish cultural holidays like Hanukkah and Purim. But I tell you what, there's, I don't know why, I never miss a party. <laughs> you know, I mean, think about it. Uh, the, the Jews say they tried to kill us, we live, let's party, you know. And uh, that's what happened on both those times. Romans 12 says, rejoice with those that do rejoice and weep with those that weep. So on the cultural fast days when they weep the destruction of the temple, no, you're not obligated. But Romans says to weep with those that weep. And if you consider them brothers and sisters, there's nothing wrong with doing it. So it's not like we're saying you have to, but for heaven's sake, the, the more you get into this whole cycle, the greater meaning it has. And, but those Hanukkah Purim is different from the Feast of the Lord, which is, you know, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Shavuot, or Pentecost, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. Those, if, if you belong to the Lord and you're grafted in, 
Start celebrating them. And just like you can't know how to ride a bike by reading a manual, you have to ride the bike. If, if you don't do them, you don't understand them to the depth. So the only thing I can say to this person, anyone else, is jump in. Start swimming. You know, that's the only way you're going to learn to swim is to swim. You can't look at everyone else swimming and say, I don't understand why you're having so much fun. You know, well, you need to do it. And when you do it, you're going to find the joy that's there. Okay, here's another one. Um, There's a crazy amount of confusion regarding Gentiles and Torah life. Here it is. Two house, Ephraimite, one law, divine invitation. I post a question here as many fellow countrymen, this is from South Africa, are being directed to your site. And I'm guilty of doing a lot of that directing everyone to your site. But I'm content uh, with the Apostolic Council's ruling regarding these issues. Now, so there are many people here at different levels of understanding, and some people here have no clue what he's talking about when he says one house, two house, Ephraimite, divine invitation. So I don't have time to go into all of that per se. But I'll just speak a little bit regarding uh, Gentiles and Torah life. I think a lot of people misunderstand Acts chapter 15. Uh, if you remember, that's when uh, the apostles got together at the council, and they said, you know, we requested Gentiles, you know, abstain from things, sacrifice to um, idols and blood and all that kind of stuff, right? That is so misunderstood. Here's the reason why. Are we saved by works? Then that means that had nothing to do with salvation. Otherwise, you're saved by not doing those things. So that, that had nothing to do with salvation. Uh, otherwise, we are saved by works. So that couldn't have been referring to that. And if, if you, when you look at those things, all those things had to do with uh, temple worship as far as Zeus, okay? And uh, the temple prostitutes. They were, you know, fornication was and other things. What they were saying to the non-Jews, and if you read Acts 15, you're going to find, they say, come into the uh, synagogue every week and Moses is read every Sabbath and you're going to learn. What they were saying in Acts 15 was this. Look, guys will you at least stop fornicating with the temple prostitutes? That's all you have to do, and then you can come in and learn. So they weren't setting a maximum bar. They were setting a minimum bar. They were just saying, look, just st stop doing that, and then you can come and you can learn about the Torah and all these things. I mean, it's very common sense when you look at it from that perspective. That's all they were saying. So uh, they, were to, they were to learn to study. Uh, you know, they say how to eat an elephant, one bite at a time. And so it's the same thing. Rather than putting this big heavy yoke on all of the non-Jews, they were just saying, hey, just stop going to the pagan temple, come and learn every Shabbat. So that's what they were doing there. But I think the, the more you understand, uh, my gosh, there's such richness in the Torah. There's such richness there. I don't know why you wouldn't want to. So uh, again, I recommend going to our website where we have all the notes are free, the videos are free, everything. PowerPoint is free for the last year, and look at that. Um, but uh, as far as who is not familiar with Two House? When I say Two House, okay, most of you are familiar with Two House. But anyway, basically, there's a movement out there from Ezekiel where it talks about the, the two sticks coming together to form one stick. You got the house of Judah and the house of Ephraim coming together. Okay, well, a lot of people emphasize the two separate sticks rather than the fact that they're one coming together. And there are some people out there that teach. Now, I, I can't say this about the whole movement because you have extremis, extremism in every movement. But there are some people that basically are saying Gentiles don't get saved. They're saying that any Gentile who gets saved really is genetically from one of the lost tribes. Okay, and I think that's crazy. Okay, because, I mean, that's just crazy. So, uh, anyway, it's too much emphasis. It also almost becomes an extension of British Israelitism and that kind of thing. So, we're not necessarily a two-house congregation. I, there are brothers that I love dearly that are two-house theology, but that's, you know, that's, they can believe whatever they want to believe. But I'm just, uh, yes, there's two houses. Yes, they do come together. The problem is how you define the two-house. Too many people are trying to find their identity in being from one of the lost tribes. Your identity has to be in Yeshua, not in being one of the lost tribes. So that's what I think is really important. Now let's see. Does anyone have any questions here? Give a chance for anyone here. Jeff. Pastor Mark, what's your best answer on why the Olive Tav was not translated in the Greek? 
Well, because you can't. It's untranslatable. It just refers to the direct object. It's an emphasis point referring to the direct object. But so it was it's not, there. It was in the Torah scrolls. Well, they should, well, what they could have done in English as well as is just put Aleph Tav there and just left it there uh, in the Hebrew letters. They could have done that. Yeah, I, I wasn't one of the translators. <laughs> I wasn't there. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so my question is, we see in Scripture sometimes it talks about uh, at the end of a prayer, and we do it here too. It doesn't say a single amen. It says amen and amen. What is the purpose? Because it's my understanding, amen is I agree with you. So I agree with you twofold or twice. What, what, yeah, what is well, it's kind of like Jacob, Jacob, Moses, Moses. You know, it's amen and amen. It's just, your, it's just a double confirmation is what that is. Yes. Any other question? Now's your time to ask the great theological questions. <laughs> Not that I have an answer, but... Okay, over here. It's a simple one. On the word Aleph in the Hebrew, you have the Yod and the Yod. Yes, and the Vav in the middle, yes. Right. But if they're both Yods, why do they look different? Well, they're, well, just like, well just, if you go on your computer and you look at the script, look at all the different script you can have. It's the same letters, but you, they can look all different kinds of shapes. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. okay. Yeah, different font. Well, one's coming from heaven and one's coming from earth. Okay. Okay. Now, here's a question that I just saw in here. Do you, they want to know, Pastor Mark, do you personally believe in a pre, mid, or post-tribulation rapture? Or something else? There's the big question. Dun, da, da. <laughs> yeah, pan trip. Everything will pan out just fine if you're serving the Lord. Put it this way. I think a lot of this is going to depend on your personal attitude. When a house is on fire, you got people running out, but you have firemen running in. Okay? Uh, I, for me, I can only speak for myself. I hope I am here for the entire time. Now, for those that want to leave early, if you want to... For, for, here's the other thing. What I believe, God is not going to consult me. So it really doesn't matter. God does not say, oh, Pastor Mark thinks this, I better do it that way. So no matter what we all believe, God is not going to consult us. He's going to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it anyway. But now, again, from personal experience, I have relatives who died in Auschwitz, okay? And so for me, it's a real big never again. And I feel more like this is the Super Bowl of human history. All of the angels, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it says they were all looking to our day when the, the grace that was going to be extended to us. So this is the big game. And when I stand before Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at that, la at that great supper when we're all there, there, I used to think, I'm going to ask them, boy, what was it like in your day? No, they're going to be saying, man, we were all looking for your day. What was it like for you at the culmination of history? And I don't want to say I hid behind a rock. You know, we're all going to die anyway. I want to go down swinging, you know. So that just, uh, you remember Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, the minute he, you know, baptized him, and then he was translated to another city. I think the same thing is going to happen for us. I think during the tribulation, all hell's breaking loose. Someone's going to come and get me, and I'll go nunny, nunny, boo, boo. And I could be in another city. So for me, uh, my prayer to God is, don't take me out of the game, coach. Put me in. You know, because I feel like my duty is more of a, a fireman, so to speak. I think this is the greatest time. God created us for this time. He needed you for the... You could have been created in any generation at any time. Now, if God... If it behooves him, I mean, I could die tomorrow anyway. So what difference does my theology matter? <laughs> really. But if God wants to take me out at the beginning of the tribulation, okay, fine. If that's, I want his will, not my will. I think too many of us are clock watchers, like in school. You don't get any work done. You keep looking at the clock or at work. And where too many of us are rapture watchers, we don't get any work done. I mean, you look at this... this uh, Urbu and Elenin and all these things. People get all caught up in asteroids and everything, and they don't get nothing done. 
for me, I'm here to work. I'm going to plow the ground until he takes me out. And it isn't, my goal isn't to get out, it's to work. And so I'm not going to watch the clock. So anyway, that's my take. So I don't know, but I'm in. Yes, over here, right behind you. Um, in Jeremiah 31. Um, yes, great chapter. Or nine, depending which one, and uh, in deference to whichever brother you might be. Um, it says that um, they will come weeping and praying as I bring them back. I will lead them by streams of water on smooth paths so that they won't stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Yes. Can you explain that? Because Ephraim isn't anybody's firstborn. Pardon me? Because Ephraim isn't the firstborn of anybody. So what does that mean? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, because, I mean, when you look at it, Reuben was the firstborn, right? Ephraim is Joseph's son. Uh, right. Uh, firstborn of, of Leah. Now you had Joseph, who was the firstborn of Rachel. And then, of course, Joseph had Ephraim and Manasseh. And Manasseh was the firstborn. Right. But it got reversed. Ephraim and Manasseh. Remember, Ephraim got the firstborn blessing. So Ephraim was considered by God the firstborn, right? The interesting thing about that, and what I think is very significant, is the fact, again, it goes back to the switching of the order, Ephraim and Manasseh. I think what God is trying to say, because evidently Ephraim got the firstborn blessing, right? So he was the firstborn, not physically, but as far as the Lord was concerned. Here's the amazing thing about this. Do you remember what Ephraim means in Hebrew? To be doubly fruitful. Do you remember what Manasseh's name means in Hebrew? To forget. Here's the story. Joseph, did, his, did he get along with his brothers? They, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to sell him. Joseph, from a personal point of view, experienced a lot of pain. A lot of pain. So here he's in a foreign country. He's in Egypt. And as firstborn, he names Manasseh, which means to forget. In other words, he wanted to forget all the pain that his family caused him. His second son, he named Ephraim, which means to be doubly fruitful because God had made him fruitful in the land of his affliction. Even though Israel was the land of his affliction from his brothers, now he's in the land of his affliction. It's a different kind of affliction. He's very fruitful. When God reversed that, this is the whole story of Jewish history. How come, have the Jews been persecuted over the last 2,000 years? Has anyone suffered as much as the Jews have? And yet, look at all the Nobel Prize winners. Have they been fruitful? They've been completely fruitful. Why is that? It's because of the blessing. Every Friday night on Shabbat, they pray over all their kids. May you be like Ephraim and Manasseh. They don't say like Manasseh and Ephraim. They say like Ephraim and Manasseh. Why do they say that? And changing their names around, forget and fruitfulness. What God was having them do to the Jewish people, may you be so fruitful you now forget the pain of your past. See, before, they had the pain of their past. If it was so in front of them, they never get anything done. How many people get so depressed, they get nothing done? Because the pain of their past is what's before them. So God told the Jacob, all of Israel, I want them to put, may they be so fruitful that they forget the pain of their past. So their, their names are reverse. Just, that's Jewish history. In the back. Mark, this isn't nearly as profound as that you just answered, but um, I heard this today. Um, there was discussion when we were having the orchestra, and I couldn't, I didn't know the answer. Okay, that they were talking about a book by Hank Hanegraaff, where he was talking about the Jewish temple being rebuilt and the sacrifices and everything that were going to take place. And their question was, why what, were they still making sacrifices after Christ came? Or did, is you mean this, after he comes back, you mean? Uh-huh. After Christ returns, okay. will the temple be sure. rebuilt okay. after Christ returns or before? Okay. And why are they still making animal sacrifices? Okay, great question. First off, did you say Hank Hanegraaff? Yes. Okay. He's all millennial, first off, or a preterist, yeah. and I don't believe a lot of his theology. I don't either. But aside from that, when the question comes to the temple, 
You read the book of Ezekiel, yes, the temple is going to be rebuilt. Uh, Zechariah, it says that the Messiah himself will build the temple. Now, there may be a temple built before he comes. I don't think it'll be real elaborate. It might just be sacrifices, but whatever they have will be destroyed when Messiah's feet land on the Mount of Olives. It splits in two and everything's going to fall to the ground and the Messiah's going to uh, build the actual temple. Yes, there will be animal sacrifices again. Now, that's not me. That's the book of Ezekiel. You just go to the book of Ezekiel and you'll see. But the big problem is Christians don't understand the sacrificial system. Okay. The, the, the table of the Lord was typically what most Christians don't understand. 99% of the sacrifices were not for sin. And that comes as a shock to most people. They had the Ola offering where the entire uh, dove or bull or goat was offered up and it all went to God. The person who brought it never got any of it. The priest never got any of it. It's like literally taking a thousand dollar bill and just burning it. That's what they did. But that was not a sin offering. Okay, they have your peace offerings. You know, Passover was considered a peace offering. And uh, those weren't for sin. You have your Thanksgiving offering. You have grain offerings. Those weren't considered for sin. And so a lot of it is just a misunderstanding of the purpose of uh, the sacrifices. But it plainly says in Ezekiel, the sacrifices are coming back. Now, here's the reason why I think, and I could be wrong, but you are going to have humans who survived the tribulation who don't have a new body like the rest of us. And uh, Isaiah talks about they'll live to be 100 years old and they'll think they're young when they die. They'll be sinners. So you're going to have humans that survive the tribulation. They don't have a new body. They're going to be the ones going to that temple. We won't have to. We'll have our new body. We can probably go to the heavenly temple. But uh, the humans, remember it says in Zechariah 14 that all nations have to come up every year to the Feast of Tabernacles. And those that don't, don't get any rain. They get the plague. Well, what they would do, they, they would sacrifice uh, bullocks for the nations. And uh, so there, there's going to be sacrifices. But that's, I mean, just that's what it says in Ezekiel. So, I mean, we can ask God why he's doing it when he gets here. But I just, that's what it says. You know, can I always explain it? No, but uh, I find God's a lot bigger than my understanding. But if he says it's going to happen, then it's going to happen. I guess he'll have to explain it later. Yes, any other questions? All right, well, let's stand and get ready for next week and the letter bait. Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for your Torah and for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to understand what you're trying to teach every single one of us. You are our mighty God and you love us so much. Uh, we just can't believe that you would humble yourself enough to, to come down to, to be with us. We love you and I pray, Lord, that you would keep everyone safe going home. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.